so um, you had good questions. That that was great. Um, <clears throat> I don't have them in front of me, but um, why don't why don't you just start with some of the questions that are more interesting to you? Okay. And uh, I'll try to answer. I'll try to answer. I can mm-hmm. sort of read them, and then we just can go through them, and then okay. go on. Maybe if you have some more things to add or something, then. You can just add. Okay. okay. And yeah, I'm very okay. excited about this interview. <laughs> wow. wow. Me too. Me too. It's great. It's great. I can get my tea, tea here. here. So, so. Actually, the first of the questions was um, regarding your name, because it betrays some sort of uh, Japanese connection. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Um, um, well, I, uh, my ex-husband is Japanese. So I went to Japan uh, to study Aikido with my teacher's teacher. And um, then I started training in Japan and met him. And then we fell in love, we got married, and then we it worked for about uh, eight or ten years. And then that was that. Okay. And was he also an Aikido mm-hmm. practitioner? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Um, and um, there was also the question of when you started Aikido and why? Yeah, um, I started in about 82, as far as I can remember, and um, why is really kind of an interesting question. Um, I was a competitive horse rider, and uh, and then my horse... Um, my horse became sick. He, he got something that uh, riders call tying up or Monday morning syndrome. And uh, anyway, I took him as far as his potential would allow uh, in competition. Um, he improved a lot when I got, from when I got him. I had to finally part ways with him. I had to sell him. And at the same time, my trainer was unavailable uh, her life, she had some life changes that made her unavailable now for, um, for coaching me, for training me. And uh, I guess I was like in my late teens or early 20s, and she said, you know, next you're at the point where you need a really good horse, twenty, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 horse. That was back in the 80s. And um, so very expensive horse now. She said, you need that for the next step, what you're ready for. And uh, so you need to find a sponsor, and you deserve it, you should do it. But then, boom, she kind of disappeared. And uh, at that age, I I had no idea how to approach people and ask them if they wanted to sponsor me, buy me a $50,000 horse or something. Anyway, so there I was suddenly uh, with no no exercise, no regular exercise, and I, I I had been riding... Um, about three to five hours per day, seven days a week, for um, for at least three or four months, and before that, always for at least like uh, three or four hours a day, five days a week. But anyway, usually seven days a week, and then suddenly zero. <clears throat> so. I just noticed that I was getting kind of like something was missing, and um, I didn't really understand that I had been be- become kind of uh, addicted to endorphins. <laughs> so, the workout and everything, and, and um, so I started looking at uh, at martial arts classes. Um, I had always been interested in martial arts, and when I was a kid, I, I wasn't allowed to do it. And uh, and so I watched a kung fu class and I watched a judo class and both of those teachers were like they were kind of like an army drill sergeant you know blah, 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 like that and I, I thought that was different from the image that I had of martial arts and then uh, I watched a tai chi class and uh, that was too slow for me at that time you know and uh, and then. I saw a flyer for Aikido, and it had an explanation, and I read it. It sounded really good. It sounded exactly what I, what I wanted, and um, 
I went, I watched the class, and, uh, and I was so surprised there was no kicks and no punches. You know, people weren't working on perfecting their, their kicks and their punches. And I thought, well, this is a really wimpy, weak martial art. And, uh, but I had a one-month uh, holiday starting the next day. And I thought, well, if I don't do something, I'm going to be really bored. So I'll do this crazy, weak martial art called Aikido for just one month. And then after that, I'm going to find a real martial art. That's what I thought. So that was all stuck. Yeah, I got hooked. So that was maybe 30 years ago or something. Yeah. Between the U.S. when you started, and then you can move to Japan. Yes, exactly. I was in the U.S. Exactly, I was in the U.S. And then uh, Bill Gleason, since my teacher in the U.S. in Boston, um, he had trained for ten years in Japan, and part of that time was with Takeda Sensei, and. and he invited Takeda Sensei for a visit in Boston. And um, the lighting is better that way, isn't it? He invited Takeda Sensei for a visit. And, uh, you know, we were very impressed with Bill Sensei. And then when Takeda Sensei came, of course, we were very impressed with him. And uh, a few of us went, went to study with him. So, and I, my first plan was to go for one month. And uh, then, for different reasons, um, my my work came to an end. And at the same time, um, I found out that the visa that I was getting was for three months. So I thought, well, okay, I'm I'm finishing my job, and so I guess I can do three months in Japan. And then I got there, and it was eighty seven. And uh, it was during the bubble economy, they called it. It was the very good economy, you know. And um, I got offered a job after maybe two weeks at Berlitz School of Languages. And they wanted me to commit to one year, and they would give me my work visa. So I thought, well, you know, this, this teacher, Takeda Sensei, you can't, you can't get what he's doing in just three months. It's going to take longer than that. And uh, so I thought, I guess I can live here for a year. So, and then I got married, and then it went longer, and uh, it just kept going and going. And what about <laughs> when you actually arrived in Japan? What about yeah. the cultural shock? Or did you feel like going through anything like that? <laughs> um, yeah, you know... Um, it was interesting. First of all, when you when you asked when you arrived in Japan, um, I got a flash in my mind, like really like a very vivid photograph. Um, my first memory of Japan. Uh, I arrived at nighttime, and uh, you know I was just. Uh, I was always on a budget. I was just uh, trying to stay as long as I could with as little money, the the budget that I had. And um, so I had one backpack on my back, and I had one backpack on my front, you know. So I was walking around like a a zombie, not a zombie, but like some weird creature. And and at that time, um, the train did not go to Narita, um, to, to Narita Airport. The train went stopped at JR Narita Station. Then you had to get on a bus and go to the airport and get off from the bus. So I got, you know, the, the plane landed. I got out, and um, I found my way to the bus. And uh, someone helped me buy the right ticket. And I uh, went out, somebody helped me find, you know, which bus stop or which bus to get on. And, uh, and I climbed up on this bus with, again, with one backpack on my back and one backpack on my front, you know, big backpacks. And uh, I climbed up onto this bus. 
And, and when I came up over the railing and could see, there was just, the whole bus was filled with, everybody had black hair and black eyes, you know. And, and I looked so crazy. And so all at the same moment, first of all, they're all facing this way anyway, but also everybody, everybody on the bus kind of went like this, and the bus was full. And they all looked at me like, and then they kind of looked away, you know. And uh, that was like right at, that was my very first night in Japan. And I felt very much like I, I really stood out. And um, so, so that was a funny one. And, and, you know, the other cultural things, you know, my Japanese got to the point where on the phone, at least for the first five or ten minutes, a lot of times people thought that I was Japanese, um, but then, you know, face to face, th there's no way around this, you know, so um, the cultural differences, I was very lucky in that in our Aikido group, there are some people who just didn't see me as Leah the American, Leah the woman, Leah, you know, whatever, I was just Leah. And um, and that was really fantastic, you know. It still is. I I go back to Japan about once once every year or so, and those people are really special to me. Um, but you know, even myself, after living there for a couple of years, when I would see another Westerner, I would start to stare too because it's just so unusual, and you just be like, wow. And then you say, oh no, no, that's how I look too, you know. It's funny. So, mm. it's and funny. then you got back to the US after this time, and yeah. you uh, started yeah. teaching in the US. Yeah. Yes. Um, I went to Pennsylvania first. That's where I'm from, and that's the east coast of the United States. Um, I'm from a, the countryside in Pennsylvania, really. So, um, as I said, you know, I, I barely, I, I barely got to uh, to keep up with what was going on in the United States. I, of course, I had newspapers. There were English language newspapers also, and uh, I could understand some of the TV news, um, but. It's so different now. First of all, there's more English and the signs and everything when you go to Japan. Uh, but also, there are things like Facebook and Skype, you know. So you can really keep in touch when you go somewhere as long as there's Internet. And there's Internet in so many places now. And uh, But at that time, there weren't. And like I said, you know, I, I would talk to my family maybe maybe once a month or something because of the cost. So, coming back to the U.S. after being away for nine years, I didn't really know what developments had taken place culturally, except for what I saw in the news. And I didn't know, so I didn't know where I wanted to be in the U.S. I didn't know. What I knew was that I wanted to be, I wanted to start a dojo. And I, want, I thought that to start a dojo, I would need a population of about 80 to 100,000 people minimum. And uh, I thought it would be good to be in a university town because I think Aikido requires a little bit more progressive mentality um, than the other martial arts just because a lot of times people can't people still have the mentality that, well, if somebody's trying to hurt me, I would want to know how to hurt them back. And that's not, not what Aikido is about. So, um, population, university, and also I wanted to find a place that had Aikido, either no Aikido or Aikido of a different style from, from mine. And... Um, and so, like I said, first I was in Pennsylvania where there was not that population in my, my hometown. 
Um, but I was thinking about these things and researching and, and uh, traveling around a little bit. And, um, and in the meantime, again, I, I can't really sit still for too long, so I started a dojo there anyway, even though it was a, a low population. And, uh, and then I, I, when I was doing my research, this town called Santa Barbara, California, kept coming up. And, um, and I had stayed here in Santa Barbara about seven or eight years earlier and loved it. Just one night. And I loved it. And, uh, and I thought, wow, it looks like this might be possible to be in such a beautiful place and have all these criteria met as well. And so um, after three years in Pennsylvania, I came to Santa Barbara for a one-week scouting mission. I thought, well, I'll just fi figure out, you know, what the town is like, and I'll see, you know, what kind of um, what kind of apartment I could get for how much money and all of that. Well, day two, a karate teacher heard about me, and he said, hey, I'm looking for somebody to, um, to rent my place three days a week. Do you want it? It's yours. I heard about you, and... You know, you're this done, and you lived in Japan, and da-da-da-da. And uh, I said, well, I don't even know if I'm going to live here. He said, oh, well, if you want to, you will, because that's the type of person you are. You were in Japan all that time, and, you know, you were a go-getter. I can think, I can tell, you know, and that was funny. And then uh, the fourth day, I had somebody say, you know what? Um, I've interviewed so many people for as roommates, and... Um, and they're all flaky, and you seem like the kind of person that I'm looking for. And, uh, and I have a, a scuba lesson in a few minutes. I have to go. So if you want, and I'm sure that your dog is a good dog, she said. <laughs> and this is a beautiful place. And she said, if you want to decide this right now and cut me a check right now, we can decide right now. So, you know, my plan was just to come and see the town. And so I said, well, just give me five minutes to think, you know. And I just sat there in her living room and was like, wow. So I wrote the check. And then uh, on the sixth day, I got back on the plane and went back to Pennsylvania. And I told my students, well, I'm moving to Santa Barbara in three weeks. So that was very quick. But, um, yeah, a place to live and a place to teach, like that. In four days. So it was sort of meant to be for you to be there. <laughs> yeah, the circumstances worked together yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. So and now um, I've had the Santa Barbara go dojo going. Uh, wow, for twelve years now. And um, I've got a former student in LA who wants to. Uh, start something in, in L.A., so actually I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be running two dojos, um, one in Santa Barbara and one in Los Angeles, so that's what's happening, and then I oversee two others, um, the Pennsylvania dojo is still going, and they usually have me out to do, do a seminar about once or twice a year, and then another student of mine has a dojo, um, very close to Santa Barbara as well. So we all, um, you know, the ones that are close enough, we have testings together and everything. Students from the two dojos come together for testing day and, and things like that. <laughs>